do we have evidence that the um, events in Norwich uh, and, and or the life and passion influenced future blood libels in, in England? <clears throat> well, we know that, well, first of all, um, I wouldn't call it yet a blood libel. It just doesn't have all of those features. I call it a child murder accusation. Yeah. Although it's not very, uh, uh, sort of, it's a bit, uh, it's a bit clunky, but still. Um, nobody died. No, no Jew died in Norwich. Um, there were a number of attempts to tell the story in other places. In Gloucester, we know. Worcester, it was known, because uh, it's uh, copied into some texts there. In Bury St. Edmunds. Um, it becomes known within the monastic communities of England, because they're very, very linked up. You know, monks move from one to another. They share books. They copy and disseminate books. And um, it's interesting that our copy, the one you mentioned earlier, the sole copy, uh, comes from, I've been able to prove that it's come from a, uh, a monastery in Suffolk. Uh, and it's bound up with other lives of saints that are new in your sense, like a collection of recent saints. So there is this culture of, spreading, copying, sharing exemplary lives. This is what these guys do. And this is what the sort of literatures that they copy and are interested in and want to share with each other. So in that sense, it it there could have been even more perhaps, you know, people reading this and thinking, but what it creates is a sort of pattern whereby now there's a story to be told when a child disappears. And we all know what that's like. People go absolutely mad. Not just the people, not just the family, communities, vigilantes attacking all sorts of suspects that turn out to be the right ones at all. You know, they don't leave it to the police again. They don't leave it to official them. They take this, as it were, uh, righteous anger and they act very often, even in our own day. So um, in that sense, um, I think it was widely spread. Uh, widely spread enough that 111 years after the purported event of 1144 in 1255 in Lincoln, in a set of very different configuration of who was a town at the time, connection with royal officials, a, a child disappears, and before a body is found, it is claimed that the Jews did. This big flourishing community, or a biggish community. So it becomes a resource of sorts. England is not a good example of the full flourishing because we have the case of Lincoln. And I mean, occasionally it is told, but um, of course the Jews are kicked out in 1290. Um, it does flourish on the continent. Flourish is a wrong word. Uh, my colleague Magda Tetter wrote a book, uh, I think it's two years ago now called Blood Libel. And she showed that I think it's largely correct that in the middle ages, the age most associated rightly with the birth of this type of narrative, this type of story. But in the Middle Ages, there are relatively few cases where it actually went through to some sort of trial and consequence for Jews. It's extremely nasty to have it in the in the sort of ecosystem in general, even if you're not accused, it's nasty to have this story on the books uh, uh, as a potential story about Jews. But the actual cases that were brought to fruition are few and spectacular. Uh, and that's partly because if you go to court, these things have to have some sort of legal underpinning, and they don't. And they don't. That doesn't mean to say that Jews are not harmed. There's a very famous case from early 14th century uh, Iberia, um, studied by Ilan and Luria, which shows that you know it's an accusation, ultimately it's thrown out of court. But in the interim, the Jews were in prison, some died in prison, their properties were seized. I mean, it does a tremendous harm, but it's, it's actually not a very easy, it's not an easy story to tell because it depends so much on moments of secrecy and conniving and, and, and it just doesn't stand to proof. And above all, I think, Jews were so embedded in European cities. They were so part of the neighborhood, so part of the business community and so on. All be, all be different. 
it's how do you make the connection between this Jew, this 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 day to day Jew you know, and this idea of the fiendish uh, 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 child killing Jew? It's not an obvious move. That's why conspiracies help. Conspiracy stories help because they give a a prior reason that a Jew qua Jew is committed to this sort of thing. But even that, so so. So as, as I said, Magda Tatter shows, there are a number of spectacular cases, particularly two in the late, very late 15th century, inquisitorial trials of groups of Jews accused. There's the case of uh, a boy called Simon in La Guardia in Iberia. There's a very famous case of, of, of Simon of Trent. And um, there are accusations often also in, in um, in uh, decrees to uh, expel Jews from given cities or regions, which happens a lot in the 15th century, and the whole attempt to go sort of eastwards, uh, the Jews who leave, or just into tiny, smaller communities in the countryside where they're kicked out of big cities, say like Regensburg, or, or there's so many. Um, often in the decree, everything will be thrown and, you know, thrown into it and the kitchen sink sort of thing. And they're known that they're a danger to Christian children and they desecrate the Eucharistic host and they disrespect the Virgin Mary, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But in fact, cases become much more common in the early modern period, as she shows and as she's done, not in the medieval period that actually spawned it. 